and Sport Now on BBC One with George Alagaya and Rob Bonnet. A palace massacre in Nepal's royal family is nearly wiped out. Mourning for their king, killed by his own son after a family feud. Backlash in Israel after a suicide bomber kills 18 youngsters. Three party leaders, one election called, get out, make sure you vote. England's double centurions, but their hard work is undone by an old-fashioned collapse. Good evening. The Himalayan Kingdom of Nepal has begun 13 days of mourning after eight members of the royal family, including the king and queen, were killed in a palace massacre last night. They were murdered by their son, the heir to the throne, Crown Prince Dipendra. He then shot himself and is now in a coma in hospital. The prince is thought to have been at odds with his family over his choice of bride. From Kathmandu, our South Asia correspondent, Jill McGivering, has sent this report. It's been a day of sorrowful tributes. Almost an entire royal family laid out in state side by side. Nepal is still in shock. Overnight, it's lost all the central figures of a monarchy which was revered and deeply loved. The story of their deaths behind these palace walls is still mysterious. Most reports say a bitter row broke out late on Friday between the Crown Prince and his parents. The King and Queen are said to have objected to the Prince's choice of a bride. The Prince apparently opened fire on his family, then turned the gun on himself. He's now been named by officials here as the next king, despite the fact he's critically ill in hospital. For the time being, at least, his uncle will assume control. But for most ordinary Nepalis, the focus today was on the grim task of saying goodbye to their king and queen. It's the custom here to do the funeral rites almost straight away, and many of the people gathered here this evening seem dazed. This funeral procession is just the start of the ceremonies and also the start of this difficult period of public mourning. This golden casket carried the late king. He was a hugely popular figure. His people's grief is still raw. He took the monarchy through major political changes, from being an absolute king to a constitutional monarch with far less power, in a system similar to Britain's. It's something his people have never forgotten. Many broke down at the sight of the dead, barely visible under a covering of flowers. As the emotion became overwhelming, police had to struggle to hold back the crowd. For many, anger was the only way of responding to a tragedy they can still barely believe. Jill McGivering, BBC News, Kathmandu. Here, the Queen and the Prince of Wales said they were deeply shocked and saddened at the news from Nepal. Like his father, Crown Prince Dipendra attended Eton College. Three years ago, Prince Charles was a guest at the palace in Kathmandu. What a contrast from three years ago. Prince Charles in Nepal at the invitation of Crown Prince Dipendra. A nice young chap with quite a lot of go about him, according to one man who knew him. Who would have guessed Dipendra would now be in a hospital coma officially the new king, but deemed unfit to rule, having apparently gunned down almost his entire family. Prince Charles, who's visited the Himalayan kingdom several times, is reported to be deeply shocked and saddened, sentiments echoed by the Queen and the British government. All across the country, the flags are flying at half-mast on the orders of the Queen, here at Buckingham Palace, on all royal residences and main government buildings, by any measure, this is a massive tragedy, but Nepal's links with Britain run deep. The Crown Prince, his father and his brother were all educated here. At Eton, Dipendra's younger brother, among those now dead, started the same day as Prince William. Dipendra himself was allowed to skip chapel, apparently, hardly appropriate for a living god, and some recall his quick temper. But others who've met him and spoken to his tutors can barely believe what's happened. They always said he was you know, very forthcoming and everything. He's a very bright student and they thought he would make a very good king. They all, that, that was the remark, you know, his teachers used to make about him. So there we have Her Majesty the Queen, Nepal, the Crown Prince Dipendra in the back there. Sir Jeremy Bagg was at school with the late king. He knew the royal family well and says there was no hint of trouble, but he fears for Nepal's future. Of course, everybody's always looked to the king and the royal family for leadership and to find that it's 
to all intents and purposes, disappeared overnight uh, is an absolute tragedy for the people. Nepal is one of the world's poorest countries. For years, it's been battling violent uprisings by Maoist militants. Ironically, their aim is to remove the monarchy. The question now is whether this constitutional crisis will spill over into new turmoil. Bridget Kendall, BBC News. Israel is reported to have given the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat an ultimatum to end the violence in the region or face retaliation. The warning comes after last night's suicide bombing in Tel Aviv, which killed 18 young people and injured 90 others. Tonight, Palestinian authorities ordered an immediate ceasefire. A night out ends in terror and death. This was just after the bomber struck. He picked innocent civilians waiting outside a nightclub on a beach. He mingled with the crowd, then blew himself up. The dead were in their teens, killed in their party clothes. Among them, two sisters who died side by side. Today, this mother was grieving for her daughter, Marina. She was just 14 and her only child. Shock in Israel and condemnation from around the world. The sense of loss here today is especially acute because the victims were so young. Islamic extremists say they have more suicide bombers ready to strike. Israelis are wondering where they can feel safe and many want their government to strike back hard. Israel blames Yasser Arafat for all this. Reports say he's been given an ultimatum. Start jailing militants in 24 hours or Israel will retaliate. Under strong American pressure today, he condemned the bombing, saying he was ready for a ceasefire. He's now said to have given the order. But Palestinian officials say controlling the streets won't be easy. The Israelis have done their best to actually demolish our police capability by hitting our police stations, our police cars and our police transmission and communication systems and command centers. And yet, I think it's only fair to say we will do our best. But Israelis want much more than that. Clashes erupted beside the bomb site today. The target was a mosque. Israelis chanting death to the Arabs, calling for revenge. Ariel Sharon can't afford to ignore anger like this. Tonight, Israelis mourned their lost loved ones. But the bloodshed and the suffering may not end here. The coming hours will be crucial, a test of Arafat's control and Israel's restraint. Orla Giron, BBC News, Tel Aviv. And Ola Guerin joins me now from Jerusalem. Ola, in your report there, you talked about Israeli restraint. In the past, they've been much, much quicker to retaliate, haven't they? A very different strategy today, George, and the result, we're told, of very heavy American pressure, which was also put on the Israelis, urging Ariel Sharon not to rush in and, and repeat fiascos that uh, occurred here in the past, like sending in the F-16s. Now, what senior sources are telling us tonight is that the plan is quite clear. They will look at what the Palestinians do overnight. They will look at what happens tomorrow. And on the basis of whether or not there is greater quiet, they will then make a choice about how they should retaliate and when they will retaliate. What they want to see is quite clear. They want to see militants being put back behind bars, back in jail, as they were before this intifada began. But all in your judgment, does Yasser Arafat have that kind of control over the militants? Well, certainly in the past, the feeling was that when Yasser Arafat spoke, the people listened and obeyed. I think now nobody can be sure of that, not even Arafat himself. It has been a big open question since the uprising began. More radical elements have come along. They have gained a great deal of support. And Yasser Arafat is in a very difficult position. Effectively, he's being asked to go back to his people empty-handed and say, we have won nothing with all this bloodshed, but now I'm asking you to stop. Ola, thank you. Here, the party leaders have been spending the day urging their supporters to turn out in force on Thursday. With just four campaigning days left, the three main parties have been targeting their core voters with promises of improving public services. Do you want more Everyone loves a winner, but Tony Blair hasn't won yet, and the last thing he wants is to put people off by looking too cocky, too confident about keeping his job. This is the tough part of the job. Right behind him, as ever, wife Cherie. 
she's got a picture of the evidence of all the female attention. But today, Tony Blair's glad-handing for the cause, campaigning on public services to show Labour's there to serve the people, not the other way round. He saw Tory warnings about a Labour landslide as evidence they'd lost the argument. It's the last desperate throw of the dice for the Tories. Because finally the agenda has come to the point where it is about the economy and schools and hospitals and they know they've got nothing to say. Vote for us and give us your strength. Give us our marching orders. Give us the mandate to do the work because that's what we need. What William Hague needs is more support. So he's been talking to farmers, debating public services and continuing to warn against the Labour landslide the polls predict. He denies it's a sign of desperation. Of course I warn about the consequences of a Labour victory of any size. They have arrogantly abused their power over the last four years. They've sidelined Parliament. Uh, they've paid much less attention to our democratic institutions in this country than any previous government. And they failed to deliver on any of the promises that they made at the last election. So yes, I warn about the consequences of a Labour victory. Just as Charles Kennedy bought a new coat, the sun came out. The Lib Dem leader's upbeat. He says voters want a credible alternative to Labour. We're not arguing with each other. We've not wasted too much time arguing with the Conservatives and what they've tried to make the issues of this election. But we have provided the most telling opposition critique of the government of the day. And they've had to respond to that. Now, if that's what we can do in four weeks of a campaign, we feel there's a lot more we can do in four years in the next parliament. She's back again. Lady Thatcher's enjoying herself and doing her best to help out Mr Hay. I'm here to say I never lost an election, therefore I hope we will not lose this one. Got the message. Of course, and Lady Thatcher is still a big draw. She goes down best with loyal Tories, like the campaign to save the pound that she loves. But now the Tories are talking about other issues too. Time is running out. The tone's been set for the rest of the campaign. Tony Blair's telling the country that he knows who's boss, the voters. It's a show of humility, an answer to the suggestion that another big Labour majority would harm democracy. As for the Tories, they'll be campaigning on many fronts, not just the Euro. And they'll go on warning against another Labour landslide. William Hague's team is denying there's been a sudden change of plan. They don't want people to believe they've switched their campaign to save the pound in favour of a desperate campaign to save the Tory party. John Pina, BBC News, Westminster. Well, there are several polls out tonight on the final weekend before Election Day. They all suggest Labour is still in a commanding lead. Peter Snow now looks at the latest figures. George, tonight's polls confirm the Liberal Democrats gaining a bit at the expense of Labour. And the Tories apparently heading for a defeat as bad as Mr Major's four years ago. Three polls tonight. NOP in the Sunday Times has Labour on 47, the Conservatives on 30 and the Liberal Democrats on 16. ICM in the Observer puts Labour on 46, the Tories on 34 and the Liberal Democrats on 15. And Maury in the Sunday Telegraph put Labour on 50, the Tories on 27 and the Liberal Democrats on 17. The best they've done in Maury and NOP since the campaign began. So until tonight, Labour have been above 45%, except in Friday's ICM for Channel 4, when they rated just 43. The Tories hovering either side of 30%, and the Liberal Democrats up to 19% on Friday. Now, add tonight's three polls. Notice the contrasting Labour leads up here at the top. But the broad trend is clear. Labour down on average from 51% at the start to 47 tonight. The Tories down one on 31, and the Liberal Democrats up four to 17. So, how would all this transform the Commons? No swing at all from last time would leave Labour with that huge majority of 179. Murray's swing would turn around 50 blue Conservative seats to red, a 5% shift from last time, producing a Labour majority of over 250. At the other extreme, ICM's poll suggests a half percent swing to the Tories and only a tiny dent in Labour's majority, while tonight's latest average, one and a half percent to Labour, a majority of around 200. One footnote, by the way, from tomorrow's News of the World, ICM found no cheer for the Tories in the key marginal seats. Where they're targeting Labour, the Tories are down four points on 1997, while Labour's up by eight. And where Labour are on the warpath, they're up two, with the Tories unchanged. But this poll took small samples, so the margin of error is plus or minus some 5%. 
Even if all these polls are more out than they've ever been, it does, though, look very bleak for the Tories, George. Two men died when a vintage jet plane crashed at the end of the Biggin Hill Air Show in Kent. The de Havilland Vampire fighter trainer from the 1950s went out of control and came down just 100 yards from houses. A spectator at the show filmed the explosion second, uh, seconds after the impact. Air accident investigators have been called in, but so far there's no indication of what caused the crash. Now, with news of another exciting day's cricket and the rest of today's...